welcome to the D3 D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Right, welcome back to another D3 D4 Football Podcast. This podcast, I have to say, has probably been the hardest to put together out of any podcast we've ever done, just simply because League One was taking the mick yesterday. So much happened, and I know... No matter what I do, to fill it all in in an hour, it's going to disappoint someone because we can't give it, we just can't give it what it deserves, I think it's fair to say. But we will do our best. Uh, this podcast is brought to you in partnership with The Big Step, tackling gambling's relationship with football. Go and give them a follow at the underscore big step. Great guys doing great work. Right, let's jump straight into the games. It's League One as always. Here we go. League One. And where better to start? Well, actually, I say where better to start. We could have started at, like, I've got about six or seven written down here in front of me that are just mad <laughs> matches. But I think Ipswich versus Bolton is a, is a you know, a, a fantastic example of two sides who are actually got more in common than people might think. Because Ipswich Town lost, obviously, at home. They lost 2-5. Ipswich 2, Bolton Wanderers 5. Ridiculous number of goals in this game. Uh, Ipswich... They've scored 10 goals this season. It's it's up there with the most in, in League One. It, so going forward, it's not a disaster. Defensively, shocking. Uh, George Edmondson, a player that I bigged up big time. He, he didn't have a great game on his debut yesterday. Um, but I'll come to that in a minute. I mean, the, the parallels that I see between these two teams, if we go back 12 months and we have Bolton Wanderers in League Two, new manager, loads of new players, a lot of uh, hype, a lot of expectation... They started dreadfully. They were awful. In fact, you know, I would I would be inclined to say at this point that Ipswich won't have as bad a start as Bolton did. Um, but we will wait and see on that one. I don't want to jinx it. Are you sorry. sure? We've, I'm not talking about just the first six games. I reckon, because if you remember, it wasn't until really January, was it, that Bolton started to click. They got the new players in. Um, and then they went on that wonderful run of 16 wins in the final 22 matches. And they got automatic promotion. So... I don't see that happening with Ipswich, though I would be very surprised if they didn't finish top half, even with this awful start that they've made. But there there are parallels there. You know, you look at um, Ipswich Town, they have individual brilliance at times, whereas Bolton, who are, I think, as a project, 12 months further on than Ipswich, they have individual brilliance, but they also have collective brilliance. They have a a very tight-knit team, know how they've been playing for the last 12 months, and they they were absolutely dominant. And if you look at the squad churn, graphics that uh, Ben Mayhew puts out. Ipswich signed like 19, 20 players this off-season. Bolton, I think, signed the least, didn't they? Or they had they had one of the tightest-knit squads in League One. Uh, so a massive credit to them for that. And I think I might be right in saying that, in, in my mind, that's why I think we're seeing Ipswich struggle and we see Bolton come to Portman Road and take them apart in the, in the way that they did. But Ed, I mean, what's, what's your take on this? Because it's been a really disappointing start from Ipswich. And Paul Cook yesterday was taking it, you know, taking it pretty well. I mean, he got a bit annoyed with some of the questions that were very negative. Um, but you sense that he he's hurting at the moment with the start they've made. Well, I just think from a Bolt perspective, I don't think there's anything they'll play more than a side that will be open against them. They, they were left... You know, I can bring up Monday night. I tried to bring it up too much because they were left very frustrated by that. It was a very frustrating draw for them against Burton Albion. Really should have been a win for them, but they made the most of that with a dominant victory. I feel like if you go at Bolton, try to go at them to score, they're just going to pick you off. And I've been loving the output recently. Dapo at the line as well off the left had a fantastic game yesterday. Oh, he did. he is a player. So play, I think he was on loan at Oldham, and he, and he, you could see there was a player in there, but you know he he was all over the place a little bit. It wasn't quite. He wasn't quite getting his game together. And I'd say that since he's been at Bolton, especially, he's kind of improving he's, every, he's all, every He's week. always been someone who's been great dribbling one-on-one. There's never been any doubts about his dribbling ability. It's what's been at the end of it. And you feel like under Everett now, you're really starting to see the end product. And if that happens, you're looking at one of the best in the division, for sure. Oh, it's exciting. That finish, was it his? Uh, the, the third yeah, the little goal. whipped one into the bottom corner. Oh, That's fantastic. Super, yes, I've run out of superlatives for that. And we've only five minutes into the pod. I mean, it was, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, great finish, but a great team effort from Bolton. I think you know you're playing an Ipswich side that are going to score and create chances because they are good. You know we we can't sit here and sort of deny the fact that this is a, a good squad, an Ipswich team that will go and I think can cause a lot of teams problems this season. 
but they don't defend as a unit. Um, they're not yet playing as a team. Do they defend at all? Yeah, well, on, to they, be fair... They've conceded the most goals in the league so yeah, far. You have got to look at that stat. Yesterday, when when you look especially at the Josh Sheehan goal, Anthony Sarsovic has more than enough time to take the ball down, pass it, then you have Burgess and Edmondson that stand at either side of him and then watch him just pass the ball into the back of the net in the left-hand corner. Like... How <laughs> how do you just stand there and allow him to just like watching the highlights this morning? Like he literally just taps it in, and they're both just standing there as if they're just waiting for him to do it. That neither one of them even goes to make an interception, and you just can't do that. They've they've got a really bad problem hanging on to leads and getting clean sheets. That's so clear and in the games. games they, of they, football. <laughs> yeah, they've played such a variety of teams as well. They've had some of the teams that you fancy being quite up there, like Bolton, maybe MK Dons as well. But they've also played teams like Cheltenham and Burton Albion and been beaten by them. They're just yeah. so incapable at the minute, it seems, of having defensive solidity. Yeah, I mean, they took Kane Vincent Young off after he was he was booked in the first half and just didn't play well. Edmondson and Burgess, Paul Cook said, looked like they'd never played together. And he said, that's on me. As a coach, he perhaps... Uh, didn't see that one coming. Walton in goal, obviously coming in because Fladke was playing badly. And I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not really sure Walton could do anything about the goals that he conceded yesterday in in any real sense. But yeah, it, it's worrying times a little bit in 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 that defensively they look pretty incapable. But actually, if, if you remember Bolton last season, they had those moments as well where they just didn't defend well. Uh, you know, and the, the problem the problem with that, James, is that I agree Bolton did turn around in January. How big a gap could Lipswich be from the top by January yeah. if this goes as it is? Well, I don't, like I said, I don't think this is a League One t- um, season where you can have a bad start. Exactly. They, they've already got a massive gap to the teams like Sunderland and Wigan up there. That's just going to get bigger if this keeps going. Although yeah. there's the reverse yeah. side of that where, in a similar situation to Bolton, Ipswich have brought so many players that they have to have time to gel and, and there's going to have to be time for Paul Cook to be able to implement that system. Um, and it can't really take until January for that to happen. Otherwise, yeah, I don't think they're anywhere near their kind of ambitions of the season to kind of touch on playoffs slash automatic promotion. I'd, I'd argue that automatics are gone for them already. I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't wouldn't know. say that yet, James, but it I, does I, feel I, like it's heading that way. Knowing, knowing how League One can be, especially over the last couple of seasons, if you look at some of the teams that have been able to get into the playoffs, or like, you know, and even they've late got a 10-point gap to make up. Happen. They've got a 10-point right, gap to make up Blackpool, already. Blackpool had a significant gap last year, and I know they didn't get into automatics, but they had a significant gap to make up and managed to make that up in, what, Blackpool 10, at least looked like 10 games or so? Yeah. For now, sure, <laughs> sure. But we found but the difference, I suppose, we were probably saying the same sort of thing about Bolton last year as well. The, the, and problem, then, the problem for me, David, is that this League One season looks so much tougher than it was last year. Well, that, that's so why many I, teams. That's so why if you I look think, at the table yeah. already, there's so many teams in that mix, and Ipswich aren't one of them at the moment. And if they don't become that quick, there's going to be a gap to make up that probably most teams couldn't even then. Yeah, that's that's why I think saying is it is it already gone automatics? But just because I don't see the best sides dropping enough points for them to catch up, sort of thing in the automatics. And there's only two automatic places as well in in League One. Whether or not they can make the playoffs, I mean, undoubtedly, I think they can. Oxford were rubbish last yeah. season at the start. We yeah. ended up finishing the playoffs, so that's definitely not out the at the equation. I think all we have to concentrate on now, though, is rather than their end of season ambition, it's just winning a game of football. You know, got to get that win, and and find a way of of tightening that team up at the back because uh, their upcoming games don't look nice either. They've got Lincoln away. They've got their host Sheffield Wednesday. They've got Doncaster at home, which you might look at as being the one, and then they go to Accrington as well. So it's not that easy a finish to the month. Yeah, three defeats in the next four then for them. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, I don't know, we'll see what happens with Doncaster because, you know, they're still, they are still struggling. But yeah, um, but, you know, let's, let's not take away from the Bolton performance at all. Absolutely brilliant. I like the fact that he's gone and got his old goalkeeper from Barrow, uh, Joel Dixon, and he's done. Yeah, I was, I was surprised by that when I saw it. But I suppose when you think about the age of Matt Jill, because they needed a shot stopper, didn't they really? Yeah, and he's done well. He's, he's done really well. Um, and I, yeah, I, I like you was a bit surprised because I thought, you know, you're thinking Bolton, they can go and get any keeper they want. Probably. I didn't think he was that outstanding at Barrow either, but I suppose he's got such a good relationship with him, it kind of makes sense to do it. He trusts him, yeah, he trusts yeah. him. I think, and I think he, he uh, I think Dixon understands his manager quite well. Whereas, you know, we we had that issue, didn't we, with Krellin last season, um, where 
you know, he's a difficult character at times, um, Ian Everett, and you can see that that would have been an issue. But, you know, if you look at the Bolton team that played, they've got Jones, Santos, Johnson, Gordon, uh, William Sheehan, Isgrove, Sarsevich, Affaline, Doyle. I mean, a lot of those guys were just key to their promotion last season, and they've added quality to it in small pockets. And I think that's, you know, that's a credit to the way they recruited and a credit to the way they're, they're playing as a team. So excellent stuff. Bolton doing really well. Uh, surprised result for me yesterday, and I may not, you know, may not be on the ball with it, but Fleet were beating Rotherham 4-2. Didn't really see that one coming. No, um, I didn't either. You know, I, I think, uh, Fleetwood, I'm beating in three now. So maybe they just, uh, start to turn a corner because they do have, um, and we did see it yesterday, Callum Morton starting to find that form and that performance level that we were used to at Northampton and that he never really recreated at Lincoln. And that was important for them. But they, they set up in a way, um, and if you go to our website, Ian Bradley has written out five things we learned from that particular match. And it's interesting to say that he thinks that Fleetwood just played really well um, and put in what he called the perfect away performance. And Helps when you've got someone like Danny Andrew can put in a free kick like that. Oh, I, I was dribbling on a Fantastic. Saw that. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's, is that the second time he's done that recently? I seem to remember. He did that at Pompey, I think. I think he did it at Grant Park, if I remember mm. right. Yeah, he's, I'm sure that's the second time he's done that this season. Uh, but frustratingly, I think, for the Millers, is they perhaps didn't have a plan B. Um, that's something that Ian picked up on. You know, they started with these wing-backs. The problem is Ogbené and Sadlier are not very good at defending. So what happened is, you know, you're getting um, Harding being put, where's Harding being pulled out of position as the left centre-back, and obviously he's perhaps much better as just a straightforward full-back. You've got Liam Lindsay trying to, to protect the the, the back uh, the back four in sort of like a holding role, and it, it just it didn't really work. Um, sorry, Jamie Lindsay, sorry, uh, holding role in that midfield. It, it didn't quite work. Um, but, you know, there were spells um, for, for the team where, you know, Ollie Rathbone is a decent player and Michael Smith scored a nice header, good placement on it to get them um, what looked like in a strong position. But, yeah, very, very impressive away performance. Rossiter, excellent. Callum Camps, for Ian, was the man of the match, sitting in that sort of deeper role like a quarterback you described him in the central of the midfield, playing balls left, right and centre, getting their attacks going. Morton and Garner worked extremely hard up front. You had Andrew and Johnson uh, playing well up in the wide positions. And, yeah, I think, I don't know, what what, what do we think of Fleetwood there? Because, again, <laughs> poor start, but starting to, starting to click into a, a bit of form. James, I have no idea what half of this league are going to do this season. Just when you when you think you've got an idea of how a team looks, they just suddenly hit thorn. We knew this league one season was going to be good, and I, I'm still still the same. Oh, absolutely. I, I honestly don't know what they're going to do this season. Now it's so unpredictable. I love it. This is why I argue that it's so much more exciting than the Premier League because I'm not being unfair to the Premier League, and I, I know that it's easy for lower league journalists and fans to knock the Premier League all the time. I mean, you know, it, there's excitement up there. Yeah, Cristiano Ronaldo returning and scoring and all that stuff yesterday, but frankly. There's no divisions that I look at where I think I have no idea whether you're going to see a team with the smallest budget beating the team with the biggest budget week in, week out. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, any any of about 14 teams could legitimately suggest they should be a playoff side this season, I would argue. Um, I have no idea what that spot four is going to look like. No. <laughs> um, there was a point where I was thinking there could be some promoted sides. Now I'm starting to think all four of the promoted sides from League Two might be okay. I know Cambridge had a very difficult day yesterday, but they've still done well overall so far. It's so unpredictable, and I'm loving it. It's brilliant. I mean, yeah, it, it is. It, it's absolutely fantastic. So well done, Fleetwood. A really good performance um, on the road. 4-2 victors, and uh, Simon Grayson deserves massive credit for, for getting that one and um, yeah, a very impressive away performance. Cambridge, like you just mentioned, they lost 5-1 at home to Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln fans suggesting this is probably the best 45 minutes you'll have seen under Appleton. And I have to say, if that's the case, that really is saying something because he has had some very good uh, halves of football and, and indeed 90 minutes of football since being in charge at Lincoln. But they were they were unplayable. Absolutely unplayable. Uh, Scally getting the... Uh, is it Scully or Scully? Scully. 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 Patrick. Yeah. What a player, though, he's turned out to be. He, 
his a goals. Of assists and two of assists goals. And two goals. Like, He's had an involvement. It's oh. ridiculous. <laughs> an involvement in every single goal in that game. Crazy, isn't who's, it? Who's Brendan Johnson when you need him? <laughs> yeah. Anthony Scully all the way. Yeah, Anthony Scully, though. The, the, it, it strikes me as being like the perfect confidence player, doesn't it? Because that's just the way he cuts inside and finishes. That's a guy who's just absolutely got a huge belief in himself. You know, utter, utterly ridiculous the way he did that. And he did it twice as well. Both his goals were superbly taken. McGrandall scored a lovely goal as well. You know, it, Fior, Fiorini's finish to the top left corner as well was was just... There was some really, really feel, good goals I feel in a bit game. for my top because it just felt like they were hitting the corners every time and he's got no chance with any of them. <laughs> no, and this has been a team, if you look at Cambridge, they, they, what was they conceded four goals in the league before this combined... You know, they they haven't been a leaky team. They haven't been a team that allows chances against in great numbers. I think Jones and Masterson have been excellent at the back. Digby and O'Neill are pretty solid midfield pairing. They just overrun. They were just absolutely outplayed and overrun yesterday by Lincoln side in just scintillating form, you know. And that, and what makes me laugh is if you looked go go back like a, a week and this just proves a, a week is a long time in football. You had Lincoln fans acting like the world was ending. You know, this team is this team is gone. We've got no chance. I mean, I read some pretty silly comments as well, which I won't really give credence to on here. But, you know, it looks to all intents and purposes, if you'd followed the Lincoln Twitter sphere, that everything was falling down and this team was doing nothing. Well, like I say, 5-1 away from home, um, playing scintillating football. Top stuff. Really well done. Uh, and... Um, just a really good interview with their CEO on the Stacey West podcast recently as well. Go and have a listen to that because it, it is um, nice to hear uh, some honesty and openness coming out of clubs about how things have been run, about the transfer window, about the mistakes they made at match days and stuff and how they're going to improve that. You know, really, really good stuff. So definitely worth a listen. But yeah, I mean, what, what can you say? I mean, we always like Michael Appleton. We know that he gets his side playing really good football. Um, the 4-3-3 yesterday just worked so well. Um, but yeah, Scully was just un, was unplayable. I mean, you say Cambridge, you think they'll be fine, Ed, based on on what you've seen enough of them so far. Yeah, I think you know, I I I do think today was just a massive off day playing against Lincoln side that finally got going after what felt like a bit of time. Um, I've been really encouraged by them. I'm loving arm side up top alongside Sam Smith. Generally, this thought or two set is really good. Wes Hula, and you just can't sleep on him. He still has amazing attacking output and creative output in them. I'm more worried about other teams than I am Cambridge. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Jamie Robson, good, good performance. Not a bad way to introduce yourself to the fans, uh, especially after losing Taylor and um, you know, a lot of, a lot of sort of disappointment about the way he went and the, probably the price they got for him. But actually, if it allows you to bring in a good replacement, then fair play and a, a really solid uh, defensive display and a, just an all-round brilliant play. And you, you mentioned Dave uh, Fiorini. He was a player that I wrote in the preseason previous the one I was being most excited to see because he he's coming with a, a pretty big reputation I think he was playing in am I right saying Holland last yeah. season um you know and to get him I thought was a bit of a coup really because there was probably teams a bit bigger than than Lincoln looking at him um but the fact that he he can't get in the starting lineup suggests that they they do have that depth and that was a worry a little bit wasn't it Lincoln's depth in their squad um but I, I think they'll be fine. Uh, and as long as they keep um, away from injuries and COVID, which has not been helpful to start this season. But fantastic stuff. Uh, any Lincoln interaction would be great on Twitter. If you guys let me know, in particular, anyone, apart from, obviously, Scully, who impressed you yesterday and what you made of that performance, uh, I'd be interesting to hear it. Um, Plymouth Argyle 3, Sheffield Wednesday nil. You just talk go on from one stunning result to another. I was going to say, talk about Rotherham United Fleetwood being a shock. For me, this is probably the biggest <laughs> shock of the day. 3-0 <laughs> victory against Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, I have to say what shocked me was Sheffield Wednesday's defending. It was t- it was pretty terrible. Um, and they've started, like, they started with four straight clean sheets, I think, this season. Uh, this wasn't a performance that looks like they'd defended at any point in their existence, frankly. Um but they, they 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 weren't without chances. I think they had 14 shots in the game. They had more possession, but whether or not they really uh, got at Plymouth enough is is another thing. Joe Edwards was superb. 
that right wing back role is just brilliant. I mean, Conor Grant's still playing left wing back, which you know when you saw him play was it last season or the season before where he was more of a central midfielder. He he's made that his own. Jeff Cotton Hardy, lovely relationship they've developed up front, and uh, yeah, great crowd. Was it thirteen thousand at home park yesterday? I know aided by the the big away following, but great to see in a bouncing atmosphere, which Ryan Lowe. Uh, alluded to in his post-match comments that he thought really helped his side. Um, he signed a late addition in the window, or after the window shut, Kieran Agard, to give them a, another option in attack. What what do we think of that one, boys? Well, no, it was this summer, wasn't it? It was it was last summer he left after being there for five years. He scored 50 goals in about 150 or so appearances, wasn't it? He was about a one in three, wasn't he, with MK Don? So that, that's it's, not, not it's bad. It's pretty ridiculous. I'm I'm not sure why they let him go in the end. But... I'm not really sure why he's taken so long to find a club because he was linked with so many. I can't, you know, I'm trying to think who who was the main one that was linked with Agard. There was at least at least two or three. I remember fans tweeting me about it, saying we were linked with him. We're going to sign him, but he ends up at Plymouth. We, he's only there till January minimum, though. So it, the impact he has or, or could have might only lead up until the January window, dependent. It depends how he does it. I just think it gives him another option. Um, you know, as as a as a striker who has got a decent scoring record and knows this level well, I think that's a very sensible signing, especially considering it's a it's a pick up on a free transfer. I uh, suppose with Niall Ennis out at the moment as well, um, that's probably a good yeah, a, yeah. a good pick to to you know have have his back up on Jeff Cotton and Hardy. Nice finish from Ryan Law as well, wasn't it? That that was a nice and sort of a nice end to the game for them. Late, late goal. Um, I'm not sure if he scored for them before, to be honest. Um, yeah, ninety plus six or seven was it that he he put that one in? Yeah, very good, very good finish. Sheffield Wednesday. Um, that was a that was a sort of very, you know, you look at the players they've got on that on that pitch. That was an awful, awful performance. I mean, defensively, you know. Allowing was it Dan Scar who scored the, the second goal from that set piece? Um, yeah, that that can't be allowed to happen if you've got a, a team ambitious to sort of to finish in the in the in the automatic play, promotion place or even in the playoffs. You know, and you look at the defensive players available: Hunt, Iorfa, Hutchinson, Palmer was the back four. That that defending is in, inexcusable. It was really poor. Uh, Peacock Farrell didn't particularly do well for that first goal but Joe Edwards' quick thinking thinking for the finish was, was brilliant to behold Bannon was kept quiet you know fair play Gregory didn't didn't really uh, do much and not, neither did Wing I mean this is a this is a team on paper that I still have a lot of faith in and they're going to have these these knocks but it's um, a little bit of worrying form perhaps for them now because you know the fans I, I saw a few of them on Twitter yesterday get quite edgy as they sort of slip down into mid-table. It's still 10 points from six games to start the season, but back-to-back defeats. Uh, yeah, but we're at the stage of the season where one win drops you up about eight places. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I just think that for a team with who started so well, back-to-back defeats is a like a, a cold kipper slapping you in the face a little bit. It's, well, it's, it's, it's this is League One. Yeah. No one gets an easy ride in League One. Anyone who's been down here knows that. Is is any team that's dropping down from the championship, especially over the last couple of seasons, we always find, or I tend to find, that a lot of the fans are like, yeah, we're just going to walk this league, we're going to come in here, and we're just going to you know, go straight back up to the championship. And I feel like Sunderland, Rotherham, some some, some of the other teams have just realised that that's not the case. But, there's a, well, there's Rotherham, a, to, Rotherham, to be fair, they do I every year. Do, I remember... Well, but, I mean, Sheffield Wednesday themselves, like, yeah. you know, they were always going to drop points some point this season they, they were never going to go unbeaten especially not in this league one um and th- th- there's going to be we we all know there's going to be times where teams will drop points and we don't expect them to or a team will get a victory out of something and, and maybe it's a little unfair for us to say that I, I think good starts can do that to you though because i remember when oxford went into the conference and we had a great start we were top for ages and and the fans were always singing easy, easy, and I thought, please don't, please don't, because I could see, you, you could see it coming. Cause we, <laughs> in some of the performances, we were we that, were that's, scraping that's by. That's like doing you know? the um, we're top of the league chant while the game's still going on. You're yeah. just asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah. oh, someone did it recently. I can't remember who it was. Same as tweeting, isn't it? Same as tweeting before the game's finished. Yeah, someone someone did that. 
someone from one set of fans was doing that, and I think it was in League Two, saying they were top of the league and they ended up losing. Yeah, it's just, like me on Friday save it night, full time. Tweet, tweeting that I'm not convinced by this Colchester team before they score two bra- a brace in like ten <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Delete tweet. <laughs> it, it's one of those things that I, I seem to be very good at on Twitter. You, what, I saw you do it yesterday, James, about Ipswich saying, "Are they on their way to a win when they equalised against Bolton?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, less said about my uh, my predictions and tweets are better. In fact, I mean, uh, I less probably... said about our entire predictions together. We had Ipswich right at the top. No, we didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you must be thinking about a different podcast. <laughs> that had... one us. That one us. No, we had Sunderland top, didn't we? Sunderland top. I I'm, think, pretty I think sure. it... I'm pretty sure we had a look in exactly how it looks now. I thought I'd be cool, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll say that in May. We'll say yeah, that. Yeah, we will. Uh, oh, dear. So, yeah. Um, but apart from Rotherham, who do literally go up and down every season, no, no other team, no other team can expect an easy ride in League One. Uh, and Charlton found that yesterday, where they were beaten by Cheltenham two goals to one at the Valley. I have to say, um, Michael Duff just continues to prove that he is one of the best managers in these in these divisions. And I'm sure Cheltenham fans, they won't like me saying this, but someone will come calling sooner rather than later for him because he is doing an absolutely fantastic job helped i have to say yesterday by the ineptitude of Charlton's first 45 minutes they were dreadful um nigel adkins really uh disappointed um, they're, they're another team that's had a really disappointing start haven't they yeah they have sitting where they were last season they have and and you know you, you looked at this chart side you can't say it's it's lacking quality i think the transfer deadline day and the the depth that they brought in with the likes of Lecco who scored yesterday. Um, there's enough in that squad to be doing a lot better than they are, but take nothing away from Cheltenham. You know, the setup that they went with was by design and not by chance. Nothing ever is by chance with uh, with Michael Duff. He knows exactly what he's doing. Long Pollock and Boyle at the back. They had Blair and Hussey as their wing backs, as they had for nearly all of last season. Thomas and Chapman were like the holding, battling midfielders, but Perry... And right, he deliberately played those two because he thought that they would be an attacking threat. Um, you know, dropping the Circum to, to bring in Perry, I thought was a brave move. Uh, Circum, by all accounts, took it really well, and and it was the right decision because you know those two caused Charlton no end of problems, and they'll cause a. They, I tell you what, they'll cause a lot of teams' problems this season. Um, you know, I, I can't pretend that Taylor Perry is someone I'm hugely familiar with, a young youngster on loan, I believe, from Wolves. He's looked very, very good, and he obviously took his goal yesterday. I mean, we all know how good um, uh, Callum Wright is just from the performances he put in with with Charlton last season. But yeah, really, really, really good. Pollock coming off obviously uh, due to cramp, uh, not quite as fit perhaps as the others with the lack of preseason. But he played well. A lot of people notice his composure, uh, and Michael Duff is a perfect man to bring uh, the best out of a defensive centre back. I think, um, and so. Huge credit to huge credit to them. I mean, you look at this uh, Charlton team, Ed. On paper, am I right in saying you know it's not bad? I mean, a lot of people were cussing Sam Lavelle yesterday as well for for not not playing well, not being a good defender. But you know, we know he is a good centre back. It should be better than having four points in six games, definitely. Hmm. There, there seems there just seems to be defensive issues at the minute with it. It's 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 quite odd. I don't. I hope it gets going quick because otherwise, a bit like Ipswich, they're going to be having a real catch-up race to do against the rest of the league. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Jayasimi and Kirk as your wingers, they should be creating chances. They they really should. They're good players. They they should be getting forward. I mean, we know Kirk was superb for the last few seasons at Crew. Um, I think Nigel Adkins is basically criticising his players for using Stockley as a direct option too often. And I think with a player like that being available if if you're not playing well that can be your automatic fallback and it doesn't it doesn't work you know it it leaves uh it leaves you open to to sort of just going being very one-dimensional and this just chant team if you look at the players should be uh a different playing a completely different style but craig mcgillivray again good performance uh by all accounts it could have been could have been a lot worse for charlton um if he hadn't been in good form and i think he deserves a lot of credit for the way he's played this season uh, but certainly not a great start to the campaign for Charlton Athletic. Now, uh, nothing really happened at the Mazuma Stadium yesterday, so we won't really talk about Morgan nope. Wimbledon. Um, it, it's, you know, this is why I, <laughs> this is why I couldn't put this podcast together. I mean, you know, 
four three to Wimbledon with you know just a last minute goal. Um, we had a worldie from Cole Stockton. He is taking the mick out of this division. A Hartigan's free kick for Wimbledon as well in the fifth minute was oh. very good as well. Like the quality of goals across League One. I, I love the fact that we've, we've got this league with all these big sides, and you wouldn't call these too big, and they're probably two of the most entertaining in the whole league. I love Ayabu Sal. It's fantastic. What a player he is. I mean, he drilled that finish to win it. Just, just a magical player. He's just a player that I just would love to have in my team. But you know, I, I can't begrudge Wimbledon. I, like I said last week, they they were. A really, really good side against Oxford. Um, and to, yesterday they showed character that you, you just know will put them in a very good position. They just, they are just like, I think you made the point last weekend that their manager just doesn't, he's very positive. He doesn't, yeah, he, t- he, he wants to win by as many as he can. He, they get two one up, they want to go and get a third. It's a lovely attitude to have to football. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Chiswick scored a great goal. Nightingale's header was, you know, from a brilliant back post cross, and he, he you know, he couldn't miss really. But just everything about this game was, was exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, Cole Stockton's goal. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> go and watch it. Uh, the ball sort of bounces up for him. He's he's midway inside the opposition half, and he loops it side footed, I think, almost over the goalkeeper from a, an outrageous distance, and it clips the bottom of the crossbar and falls into the net. Absolutely superb. And this is a player who, let's be fair, at Tranmere and Carlisle was just so average. You know, he's found his home at Morecambe, uh, a, a team that get the best out of him. His confidence is absolutely booming. And he's, pray, he's playing absolutely brilliant football. Absolutely brilliant football. But fair play to FC Wimbledon for, for doing what they did there. Because, you know, you, you look at the team, you look at the fact that they went 3-2 down to that sort of goal the crowd are up. It's it it could be easy to suggest that, that that would get a team to sort of drop their shoulders in that, but no, no, Mark Robinson's teams don't do that, uh, and they came storming back to, to to win it, and it's been a brilliant start of the season for them, and they've now scored more goals than any team in the division. Who would have thought that after what six games? Can we have Wimbledon versus Bolton every week? Because that would just be so entertaining. <laughs> Those when, two. Just when do they play each other? They, they played the opening day, if I remember right. It was three three, or one of the early opening days. Oh yeah. Can they just play each other every single week? I kind of want that. Can we just stick them in the playoffs and have two games between them? Yeah, that'd be amazing. Because I would watch that non-stop. It's think... so entertaining. Yeah, there they have been some great playoff games over the years. That'd be a wonderful one. I mean, if Wimbledon make the playoffs. I mean, at the minute, if the, I mean to be fair, if we stopped right now, it'd be Wimbledon and MK Dons in the playoffs, and that'd be quite entertaining. That would be entertaining. And in fact, you know, um, it'd be hard to pick a winner. It'd it be would. hard to pick a winner. Inside game to win Ridiculous. Yeah, and it seemed, for, you know, you talk about the three-all between Wimbledon and Bolton. That seems like an age ago for some reason to me. I don't know why, but it does. Uh, MK Dons, speaking of them, they beat Portsmouth 1-0 yesterday to keep their performance going. Troy Parrott is playing football that is just, yeah, I mean, he's he's having a great season. He gets the ball in deep positions. He, you know, the goal that they scored to win it, he, I think he played the ball um, at wide to Scott Twine. Scott Twine goes on the run down the left hand side and then knocks it back for Ethan Robson to finish. And and that was a very 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 good goal. It was a very MK Don's goal, you know. Um, and it... it's the kind of goal you need to beat Gavin Bazuna as well, who's had a really good start to life at Portsmouth. Absolutely, and seven hundredth league appearance for Dean Lewington. 700. Wow. That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's it is it's absolutely huge credit to him. I mean, you know, in American sports, they go, oh, this guy's played a thousand games. Yeah, but you play 82 games a season. <laughs> you know, if you're baseball, you play like 160 <laughs> games a season. This is football. You know, to play 700 league games is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, you know, he, he may not be everyone's favourite character, especially when you play against him, but he... He deserves a massive, massive amount of credit for the way he's looked after himself and been just such an integral part of this side uh, over the years. So, brilliant stuff. Uh, Danny Cowley, though, struggling with Portsmouth. They've, they've lost their scoring touch, haven't they? Yeah, it's, it, it's really, it must be really frustrating being a Pompey fan because every time you look at them and think they're starting to get good, they just go flat again. Mm. And then they start getting good again. They just constantly... It's really frustrating watching from the outside. I can only imagine what it's like to be a Pompey fan. 
yeah, well, I, I, I grew up there. And I grew up around Pompey fans who all were trying to persuade me to be Pompey fans. And then my other set of friends were all trying to persuade me to be Southampton fans. And then my uncle was trying to persuade <laughs> me to be a Reading fan. And, and, yeah, and you my, ended up with Oxford. How's that work? My dad put his foot down. That's what happened. Okay. I said to him, Shall I might support Reading with my uncle. No, you're not. You are not supporting Reading. <laughs> you're not going near Reading. He said, you are an Oxford fan. <laughs> to be fair, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't force me into Oxford. I could have supported Pompey and Southampton. But I think the bickering <laughs> between the two sets of supporters <laughs> kind of put me off. So, yeah, I became an Oxford United fan, and it's been interesting. It's been interesting. But, yeah, Portsmouth, no goal in their last three league games now. Um, bit of a concern. Right, well, to round up the rest of League One, because there were some other good games. You know, Shrewsbury and, and um, Crewe played out an early six-pointer, you could argue. Uh, it finished 1-1. So, you know, one point apiece. Uh, the rest of the points, Crewe sold to Cardiff. So, there we go. Sunderland, four straight home wins, guys. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. first time they've started a season with four straight wins at home since 1975-76. Oh, that's a stat, isn't it? Yeah, it took me ages to look that up. It really did. <laughs> I was going through the league tables thinking, goodness me, when the last time... I was thinking it must have been in the, in the sort of 90s when they had that, that great run and, and, and promotion, but nope, no, 75-76. <laughs> and they finished top that year, so good omens, eh? Um, good start. Really good start from them. Uh, lovely goal, Carl Winchester, who's made right back his own scoring. Dan Neal as well. That's a great strike. The real deal, Dan Neal. That's his new nickname. He's the real <laughs> deal. What a finish! And being a- being Ackerton's well worth shouting about as well because they've started excellent too. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's a that you know people think it's under beating Ackerton from outside looking and go, well, that's easy, isn't it? Uh-uh, no. no, no, no. That's a that's a very good result and not to be sniffed at in the slightest. Uh, Wigan beat Doncaster 2-1. Fair play to Doncaster for, for... I thought they played reasonably well. Um, shock lead. But uh, Wigan came back, of course, and got the points. Wigan have had a great start to the season. Uh, we will talk about them more in future episodes. But seeing as there's only three goals in this game, I'm sorry, guys. You, you dropped down the pecking order somewhat this week. <laughs> uh, Burton drew one all with Gillingham. Nice to see for Dane Oliver getting his second goal of the season. I thought he finished that one. Oh, finally. Really nice. Oh. You're talking about finally. Kane Emmings finally scored the Burton. I'm relieved by that. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, that game in itself was just... It literally... I don't know about you, Ed, but it could have it could have gone either way entirely. It was one of those games where Burton could have nicked it. Gillingham could have nicked it. For me, Jamie Cummings was absolutely superb in, in a yeah. lot of different one-on-one well, situations. We're, purr- we're purring over Harry Chapman now, so I can't wait to see more of him over the season. Yeah, yeah, that's a good pick-up. That is a good pick-up. And Oxford myself. United drew nil-nil with Wickham in what was 90 minutes of handbags and hair-pulling. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly summed up. Yeah, there we go. Right, again, we won't really pay a huge amount of attention to the League One table, um, but it's going to be exciting. It's certainly going to be an oh, exciting season uh, as this cranks up. We'll start looking at it properly after about 10 games. I, that's what I always like to do because I think you can tell a lot about um, how the teams have started after about 10 matches. Uh, but right, right let's, uh, let's get moving because we've got a lot of League 2 to do and we're running out of time. So let's jump in now. League 2. Uh, we start League 2 with a fantastic game of football that was blighted by, yet again, more racism. It was Barrow 2, Colchester 3 on Friday night. I watched the game on iFollow. Really good match. Uh, Colchester started really poorly, actually, um, allowing Barrow to dominate much of the, the first half. But they scored two quick goals on the counter, both taken really well. Alan Judge, I thought, will be, you know, you see him coming back. He's been out with uh, with an injury coming back. He looks like he'll be a... A very important player for them if he can if he can find his form. Um, but here we go again, guys. Shamal George in that first half, uh, racially abused by fans behind the goal. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm absolutely sick of this. It seems like we're talking about it every other week. You know, it, uh, the country is is we, we saw it with the England team. Uh, we saw it at the Gillingham game against Lincoln. We've seen it uh, again. Uh, on Friday, and it's it's a, it's a disgrace. I mean, I don't know what to say to racist people. I think we should, if if you're if you're racist, we should make them wear like a cowbell round their neck as a as a form of shame. They shouldn't be allowed on football grounds. Oh, just outrageous! Shouldn't be allowed. I anymore. mean, 
the fact is, is at the end of the day, we are talking far too much in terms of we should never have to have these conversations. And we are talking far too much or having, let's say, having to talk far too much about these conversations, because at the end of the day, this kind of thing should not be seen in football. Um, I, I don't understand what people get out of it. I don't understand why people feel the need to, you know, OK, fair enough. If you're at a football game, you're always going to throw jabs at players. That's just how it is as a football game. Right. But there's no need to do it based on a person's skin colour. Like, to me, that just makes absolutely no sense. Like, if you're sure, call out and say, oh, you're a crap footballer or you're this or you're that. that OK, that's just football. That's just being a fan. There, there gets to a point where you've just got to stop being that kind of person. And it's a, for me, it's a very small minority of people that are causing such a big ruckus because they're the kind of people that you just want to be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Stop doing it. Like, what is the what is the point? Like, I don't get why people feel the need that this is an acceptable way to behave. I don't understand racism at all. Like I've I've said before in this podcast, you know, you don't you don't shout at someone or you don't you don't abuse someone because of the color of their eyes. It, it you know it's not something you would notice. And for most of us, you don't even notice someone's skin color. It's it's irrelevant, you know. But there are there's a this is growing feeling in our society, and I won't go into the, my personal belief as to why, but the racism is coming back in a way that I've, I've never seen it. Like in the 90s and early noughties, I was going to football week in, week out. And to be honest, I never heard racism. You know, I, I'm just being honest. I'm sure it existed. You know, we know it existed. Maybe I was not in the kind of grounds where where it was or in the places well, maybe, where it was happening. Maybe but... just people weren't so brash about being overly overt about it. Whereas it seems at the moment, people don't care. Like they don't care how they're perceived. They don't care if if people hear them do it or, or if they or if they or if they do it at all people They've just been don't emboldened care. let's be honest like, this brazen yeah, and emboldened like, attitude it's, it's just disgusting the fact that anybody feels like it's an acceptable way to behave in any possible circumstance they need to honestly there's a lot of people or, or a minority of people at some clubs in my own included that need to take a long hard look at themselves and realize is this really the place that they should be in terms of a football stadium and need to be thinking about some of the views that they hold? Um, Cause honestly there is, it's no good me sitting here and saying like, Oh, there's no place for racism in football because there's no place for racism anywhere. It just shouldn't be anywhere, regardless of whether it's on a football pitch or regardless of whether you're out and about, it just should, this shouldn't be a thing. We shouldn't have no. to have these discussions. We're Especially into the not dark for like ages, the second or feels. third time in a season. Yeah, it's a joke. It is. It's embarrassing to be honest. You know, and generally speaking, you you know when you're near racist because you hear that little ding 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 as their tiny little brains bang around in their empty head. You know, um, it's very depressing. Very very depressing situation. But Shamal George, to be fair to him, he he ultimate professional didn't rise to it. I think he just reported it, uh, and they won the game, which is a it's just an absolute brilliant way for, you know with with playing with 10 men for a lot of that second half as well um you know they 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 rose to the challenge and his teammates did him proud and and you know fair play to 120 colchester fans making that trip on a friday night some of them some of them left at about 10 a.m and missed the kickoff at 7 45 because it's the traffic which is just crazy uh but yeah um very good performance though going back to the football you know in the end um Barrow will be kicking themselves because they were the better team, I think, over the 90 minutes. But, you know, they just switched off for a set piece at the end. Tom Eastman getting the goal to, to win it. And uh, and Colchester get a very big and important three points on the road. Barrow continued to struggle um, after, you know, they, they thought they were going to build on their win against Oldham. But uh, in the end, uh, could not do so. Uh, now, Walsall beat Mansfield. Now, I promise you, Walsall fans, I will not mention the word dark or horse in any of the next... <laughs> Five minutes of this podcast, right? Or any, or any of any crepuscular mustache or anything like that. You know, we're just going to talk about the game itself and what we observed. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you. Anyway, so a three-one win for Walsall, much needed. I'll tell, it has to I'll be tell said. You what we observed, it was a shambles defensively for Mansfield again. It, again, and al- already just, you've got so Nigel Clough I can't calling. Stand how bad these defences doing at the minute. Tinati was awful. Let's be honest. No, he was. He was. Dreadful performance. 
you know, and I, and it didn't come out with any uh, any credit either. I mean, just long balls played over, and George Miller is just he is the kind of player that um, Walter were crying out for. But he's not exactly a unit, is he? He's a good size, but he's not like other strikers in this league that would be impossible to get near to. No, but I think what he does have is huge determination and energy. He's <clears> he's you know he's a player that when he gets confidence, you can see him really taking off. Because I don't think his you know, his career has gone exactly as he'd have hoped. You know, he obviously was he moved to Barnsley has has not really transpired into him becoming the player that a lot of us saw in him. So this is a great move for him and for Walsall. Uh, you know, we talk about Walsall missing Labadee, Connor Wilkinson, Rory Holden. Uh, these are these are big players in what is quite a small squad to be at with, without. But Jack Earring is, I think, the 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 Holden. Yeah, if, if Holden is one A, he's one B. You know, he's he's come in and done a superb job in that sort of attacking midfield playmaker role. Maybe sort of, you could argue he's playing as a ten, perhaps. Um, but he he's a very very good player. Phillips and, and Kiernan, I thought were credit. I mean, Kiernan has probably been the most consistent player. Interesting that they had Kinsella and Shade in that holding midfield pairing, because yeah. Shade is kind of like a winger, um, and yet. Matt Taylor preferred him over both Alfie Bates and uh, Sam Perry, which I thought was quite interesting. There's usually a David there a couple of times as well. It's quite interesting they've gone with that. Yeah. But it worked. It, well, yeah, well, Did yeah. Job. Roland Manais, of course, couldn't play because he's, um, he's on loan from Mansfield. So Taylor and Month, I thought, did did quite well. And Rushworth, when called upon, looks like he's going to be a really good pickup. He's a really dependable keeper. So nice, nice performance from Walsall. Uh, Mansfield had big defensive problems though like we said just embarrassing the, the the way that they defended in this but what what's slightly worrying me as well is Nigel Clough's getting a little bit personal a little bit um, he does this you know he when, does do this he said if they can't do their jobs we'll change the personnel well the transfer window shut mate you know also these are two centre backs that came in under his watch so mm, indeed. I don't know if he necessarily is the one who approves the recruitment or not but it's not looking good for him if the centre backs he's brought him are doing this he, he's just he he calls out his players a little bit for my liking a little I mean fair enough they deserve it but um, it's just that it's not a good look you know he said he, he was calling out Reese Oates for not being you know able to create anything saying he just he got in great positions he didn't do anything I was like okay but you know don't call him out he said the only players that came out with credit were Bishop and Hawkins and he said I could have subbed the whole rest of the team off at half time and he said I wish I had five subs again like last season so I could have changed everything. Which I just thought, yeah, okay, you can see he's annoyed. But yeah, big problems for Mansfield. Uh, set a great pieces. way to motivate your team, though, isn't it? Mm. Great way to show your team that you're on their side by just saying, yeah, like, I'd take you all off. And Unless his tactic is to kind of get in their heads and be like, all right, like that's the way he's trying to motivate them. But, How often does that work nowadays? Though? Well, it doesn't, does it, really? Like, man management is becoming more and more of a thing in the modern game and just... Especially with young players. So, you, you can't... And people going so about, the, people going about like, the hair dry trim and the Ferguson ad. It can't work all the time now with footballers. Well, no, it doesn't. Especially it, publicly. That yeah. was a very different time in football as well, though. Like These days, the game is much more... As, as a management position, it's much more focused on individual man management. Well, well, and one thing I would say is I think management in football is becoming increasingly like management in any other business. Like You wouldn't get the hair dry treatment in Tesco's, would you? If you no. You know, you just wouldn't. You know, and you Depends can't. Did you work down the aisle or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but you know, to to be honest, I, I think we're seeing more of a parallel between how you manage people in a normal workplace as as you are in football. You know, no longer is it acceptable to shout at people and chuck football boots at their heads. You know, yeah, it's kind of not not the done thing anymore. So, uh, I can I can see why uh, his attitude might not be the way. And actually, if you saw Sam Nicholson's interview on the Gascast podcast. Um, I didn't actually listen to it, but I, I saw the transcript from it, which was reported in uh, on on the Bristol Live website. Um, you know, he talked about how, as a player, you start to if you if you start to become very negative in the way you think, it makes you mentally ill. And it, it can, you know, being a professional sportsman, I can see why young players fall into that trap and and do then have problems. So, I would I would say not the best way to manage things um, at all. Uh, Leighton Orient beat 
Oldham 4-0. I don't think with that surprise by the win, but nice to see Leighton Orient Theo Archibald having a great season. Lincoln fans will be delighted that he's basically superb. You know, he's he's doing really, really well. Uh, he's got a great relationship that he's built up with Harry Smith. Drinnen has come in, and that front three of, of Archibald, Smith and Drinnen, I love it. Really impressive. Yeah, I like Tom Jones and Connor Wood as a pair of wing-backs as well. Yeah, they changed the system to like a 3-4-3, three, three, haven't they now? Yeah. Um, and it's and it's it's looking a lot... It suits them. I think Harry Smith coming back to fitness is a big part of how, why it's working for them um, because he is a focal point and allows them more skilled players. But the fact that Dan Kemp is not really getting um, an automatic start is, is just like a, a testament to the strength and depth this Leighton Orient side have. Old and big trouble. I mean, like they've still got nine players out. Um, they picked up another injury with Nicky Adams yesterday. I mean, it's it's looking desperate. I've, I've got to be honest, I can't see them th- anyone finishing below them at the minute. No, no. It I've... really feels like they're just going to finish bottom. Yeah, it's it's really desperate. I mean, I, I would I would love to see. I'd love to see how they do with what Keith Kerr thinks is their strongest eleven. Um, I'm still not convinced they've got enough attack. I mean, Bahambula and Hopcut perhaps will, will will be very good players because they have got. Some, some clear pedigree and skill, but yeah, not not convinced about that defending. I mean, why Mansfield wanted Piagiani <laughs> after? It, it, the big problem with Oldham, though, we all know, is not really Keith Kerr and the players; it's elsewhere. Yeah, it's everything. I mean, the situation with these tickets, what a mess that is! Not yeah. allowing your own fans to go to games unless they have season tickets—that's just outrageous. It is. It is. It's just an untenable situation. Um, and, you know, and, and there was, we won't go onto it here, but the. The chairman made a, a, you know, a public address on Talksport, I think it was, you know, and he, he sounded sounded like he's ready to listen to the fans, and then they issued not long after the ticket uh, thing came up, and it's like, yeah, here we go. Not great, but well, at Leighton Orient, uh, a really good performance from them, um, as it was for Exeter at Scunthorpe, a four 0 win for them. Matt Jay with a brace. Um, I have to say, you know. I still think Scunthorpe are going to struggle. You know, I, I I don't like their squad. I think Neil Cox has done a pretty good job to to start them how they have, but I think with Exeter getting players back into into their stride and into fitness now, uh, you're looking at their squad and you're thinking, yeah, this is this is pretty good. It's pretty strong. Uh, I think was it Ross Millen who who was playing his. Um, only a second or third appearance for for Scunthorpe had a really poor game according to those on Twitter. They had they had Scrimshaw and Bunt as their their attackers. That midfield though of of Perry Wood and Hackney. I mean they're all kids. You know the whole team's kids really, if we're honest. It's it's it such is such a young group. Yeah, such a young group of players. Um, and and they were just basically just boys against men, wasn't it? Literally yesterday in in some respects. But you know Exeter are just. They've got an excellent keeper. Their back three of uh, were, were solid. Key had a good game. Uh, Matt Jay was excellent. Um, Giovanni Brown was superb. Sam Lombe obviously had a bit of a stop-start sort of time since uh, joining, but you know he's a powerful runner, and I think he'll uh, he'll still be a really key player for them this season once he once he finds his form. But yeah, a four-nil win and Exeter will take a lot of confidence from that because they haven't, again, they've been one of these sides that haven't started the season particularly well. Um, I've not been like worried by them or anything, but you know, you look at the, the results they've picked up and I think uh, Matt Taylor would certainly... Eight, eight of their nine goals so far have come in two games. The 4-1 over Bristol Rovers and that 4-0 there. Yeah, exactly. So they can thrash James, but they're not thrashing people enough. I think we'll see. I think we'll see once they get a consistent lineup, and that has been the problem for them so far this season. I, I think we'll see a much stronger uh, and more consistent Exeter City than we have so far. And I think Matt Taylor would probably agree with that. Uh, Sutton got their first ever win in the Football League. They beat Stevenage two one. Um, there was a lovely story, wasn't there, Ed, in this one with the substitute of uh, forty year, a forty year old player coming on off the bench um, who had been with the club for like. He's a club legend. He'd been with them for years, uh, years and years. I'm just getting his name yeah. because it's uh, Craig was... Dundas is his name. Craig Dundas, that's it. I believe he was playing for Sutton United a lot further down the non league pyramid. For him to actually make his ESL debut is just a immense dream. What a great day for Sutton United. Fantastic day for them. Uh, and I think in the end, you know, uh, I was interested to see that that. Uh, John Barden started the game. I know he had picked up an injury. I think he only lasted, so yeah, he lasted five minutes. 
as he came on. Yeah, but I've seen enough from this Sutton side to suggest to me that they will be fine this season. I, I'm not too worried. I think they play um, a very straight 4-4-2 kind of style. They're, they've got good wingers. Enzio I'm quite, really like, I'm quite liking Boy. David Ajibo on the, on the wheel, he, he, yeah, out he, wide. Yeah, to me, he was their best player and most exciting player last season in the conference. Um, and he's he's doing the same again in in this division. Um, they were slightly unfortunate, let's be honest, to lose to Oldham uh, in in that in that game last week. They've had a bout of COVID, which uh, cancelled their match against Colchester. Uh, but yeah, first win, first win on home soil as well in the football league, and good to see Mr. Bennett, Richie Bennett, getting goals. Obviously, he has played in the, at this level before. Um, played for, previously for Port Vale, right? Yeah, and Carlisle as well. Um, more can for a little while as well. Yeah, he's had a few clubs, and and yeah, he he that's his first goals for Sutton, I think. So, uh, good to see. Uh, the rest of the division, um, Hartlepool deserve a shout, a one nil win over Bristol Rovers. Their home form in twenty twenty one is insane. They've yeah, been they... beaten twice, once yeah. in the League Cup, and then early to Maidenhead United towards the back end of last season. That's in it. the whole of in the whole of in the whole year. of twenty twenty one. Their home record wow. is like wins, loads of wins, and a couple of draws and two defeats. It's ridiculous. Wow. Indeed, indeed. Uh, we had Forest Green Rovers beating Northampton by goal to nil. We had Crawley beating Carlisle two one. Tom Nichols scoring. Uh, finally getting his uh, his season off to, to off, off the mark, and I think he'll be a very big player for them. Tramier's goal scoring continued to be an issue. They lost 1-0 to Rochdale. Rochdale, I'm not surprised about uh, them starting to play well. If you look at the data behind their performances, they're creating better chances than anyone else in the division. I think they've got the best XG out of all the teams in League 2, so keep an eye on how their performances go. I mean, they do give up more good chances than they perhaps would like, but that's Rochdale for you. Uh, Salford beat Bradford by a goal to nil. Very late goal in this one. Uh, Gary Bowie with a bit of revenge against his old team. Uh, He was taking a fair bit of stick, it's fair to say, from the Bantam away following throughout this match. Um, And obviously the other Friday night game saw Harrogate draw two all with uh, with Newport County. And, And before we go, Ed, tell us a tale from your trip to the county ground. Yeah, um, not quite as eventful a tale as Mansfield Town, but I quite enjoyed this. I thought it was quite a battle, and you could see that with the full-time celebrations from Port Vale. They got a 2-1 win away from home. I think it's the first time they've won at Swindon since 2005. Ben Gary's so, got no quality, according to Chris Stringer. Oh, currently, but he's got two goals <laughs> in this game. I quite enjoyed it. You know, Swindon, despite the defeat, um, any major pre-season concerns we had about them should be long gone. This is a really fun side. And I love the thought options they got. Tyree Simpson up top is just an absolute unit. He's a battering round with the centre forward. He's really fun to watch. They've got this three behind him, people like Jack Payne, um, Johnny Williams and Alex Gilbert, who are just so fluid. They love drifting between attacking midfield and wide positions and they're so difficult to mark. I guess the only real worry with Swindon is that if they lose Tyree Simpson, there isn't really an alternative in the striker positions. So they no. are still a bit dependent on him being available. But they're going to a lot of fun. I think they'll be really fun to watch this season. Vale, I don't think, were that spectacular. If they capitalised on the amount of set pieces they had, they'd have won that comfortably. But two moments from Garrity, two good hits. The connection to the first one's fantastic. Brilliant and then the winner is a bit of a shambles from a Swindon perspective, certainly about how it bounces around inside the box. But you take that win any day. Really well done to Port Vale. They've had an up and down start, but... Um... Yeah. I do think they've uh, they're an improving team, and uh, it, you know under Daryl Clark it'll be interesting to see which way their season goes because obviously we saw what we thought was an improving Walsall team under him for a spell last season and then they didn't. Uh, so yeah, they pressed well. They did press well because Swindon were trying to play out the back and Port Vale adopted this very good press. They basically forced the ball off them a lot of times in Swindon's own half, and if they capitalised a bit more on that. Really could have been a comfortable day for them, but they got the win regardless. Good stuff, and uh, I'm glad you enjoyed your day at the County Ground, mm-hmm. Ed. Uh, guys, thank you for joining me this morning to talk all things League 1 and 2. We hope we haven't disappointed too many people with our rather <laughs> uh, rushed coverage of some teams. It's just There was just so much to talk about. I get the feeling this isn't the first time we're going to do this this season. It's going to be like... Yeah, I hope not. Because it, <laughs> it's uh, going to be like this most weeks. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I think... Uh, 
I think uh, I think it'll be a very entertaining season. And apparently, uh, Gareth Ainsworth and Carl Robinson are still scrapping in the car park at the Sam Stadium. So <laughs> if someone could go and break that one up, it would be good. So we would like our manager back at some point. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for our patrons for supporting us. And thank you for the big step for partnering us. Ed, uh, hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. I certainly will do. Thank you, James. Really enjoyed uh, being part of this. Yeah, I'm glad. It's great to have you on board. And David as well. Have a good uh, rest of your week, mate. Thank you. Uh, back in school, but I intend to play some more D&D this weekend. So proper nerd over here. <laughs> 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 That's how I'm spending my Sunday. I'm just uh, trying to stop my kids killing each other. So there, there we go. <laughs> the fun never stops in my house. No, actually, this there might be a fun fair locally. So yeah, it might actually get them out of the house to burn some energy. Let's 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 take that uh, as the option. I'm sure it's going to be uh, more successful. But everyone else, thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, uh, and I hope you're enjoying your football at the moment. Until next week, goodbye. Mm-hmm.